Amen and amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Good to see you today. Get this over with. Go Texans. <laughs> we found out yesterday at the Denver game that God's not necessarily obligated to any team. <laughs> but we'll pray anyway. It's good to see you today. I'm glad there's so much more going on in football in our lives, aren't you? God is a good God. We've been in this series of messages. We'll get into just a moment on the sync series. But uh, just to remind you, a few weeks from now, we'll be doing our end gathering that we do for our annual Ford and Faith pledges that we make towards our building funds and paying off the, the, uh, the debt load that we have, which is a minor debt load compared to everything else. But nonetheless, we'd like to get it paid off in the next three or four years. So let's be faithful. You'll notice in your bulletin where those totals are kept each week. And we are right on target, only about $90, I think, away from reaching the goal. Uh, if you haven't done your part, uh, don't just thank somebody else for doing a little extra. Do your part. Amen. Amen. And uh, we'll be coming up to a few more weeks of making some new pledges in that regard for the next year. We do this every year and just helping us uh, reduce the debt load in the church. And we paid off by paying in so much early. Uh, we're so much closer to have the building paid off than it would have been 10, 12, 15 years down the road. So that's been because you've been gracious and you've been benevolent. And we continue to pray that you do that. God continues to bless you as well. We're in our series on sync and synchronizing our life with the Lord God Almighty, whom we do adore. You know, as I uh, went through this series and started thinking about this series several weeks ago of just getting our lives in sync and going to the dictionary and looking up sync and all those things and seeing these definitions I shared with you last week that basically means to cause, to go on, to move, to operate, to work, etc. at the same rate and exactly together. That is the heart of God, I believe, for us as individuals. But it's also the heart of God for us as a church, that we as a church, or we as individuals, be in sync, be in step with the Holy Spirit in our life. Too many people are out of step and out of sync. Another definition was to call sound and action to match precisely. Certainly, that needs to be what's happening, that the sound of God's voice be what is recognized as we walk with God and we're matching our action. Really nothing more nauseating than watching a TV show or an old movie or something where the video is not quite in sync with the voices going on or like watching some Japanese flick that's been translated into English. Just a little, little, uh, drive you a little bit up the wall, at least me. And also another definition for to sync something was to occur at the same time, coincide or agree in time. Now, as I started this series of messages, I didn't realize at the same time that I'd be getting my wife a newer smartphone. Uh, now, obviously, I have some of these smart devices and, you know, the iPads, iPhones, and PCs and all the tablets and things that people have in our culture. And we realize how important it is to keep everything in sync so that we don't miss our appointments. And the more we rely on these devices, the more important it is that we are synchronizing those devices with each other. If you're not trapped in that trap yet, save yourself. Don't go there. Amen. Uh, run as fast as you can. It's too late for me. But uh, I did go and get a, a new smartphone for my wife and... Uh, after about two hours of trying to sink it, she looked at me and she says, aren't you sorry you decided to preach that sermon series? <laughs> Isn't it amazing how often we have to experience something in our life when we preach on it or teach on it? But anyway, it is important. You know, last week we talked about in part one about getting the right connection. Today we'll talk about getting the latest version or the latest update. The right connection is most important if you're going to get synced correctly. And that means you have to have a relationship with Christ. You, you just can't just say one day, wake up, say, you know, I think I'll be a better person or I'll, I'll try to be a moral person or, and, and have your life together. Life comes from the author of life. The author of life is God, our father, and he gives life through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And only when you come to a personal relationship with him are you going to know what it means to have genuine life. There, religion's not going to substitute it. Denominations aren't going to take the place of that. God is the only one who promises to give life. Jesus said, I've not only come to give you life, I've come to give you life abundantly. So if you want to experience real life, then you have to have real Christianity, real salvation. And remember, we talked about last week the real versus the counterfeit and how important it is that you go to the Bible to discover what it really means to be saved. You may come up with your own opinion, but once you cross the threshold of death and step into eternity, you'll find out that your own opinion carries no weight whatsoever. It's only what God has established and what God has said, that is what truth is. And so as we step into eternity, we certainly want to make sure before we make that step, we are in tune with God and our life has been brought into a proper relationship with Him because if it's not, we're just going to miss the mark completely. Then in we were closing that message last week out of Romans chapter 6, we talked about that the Bible is the only reliable source 
And how in that it says, you know, before you met Christ, you used to yield your members, your body, as instruments to unrighteousness unto, unto death. But now that you've received Christ, now that you've been made new in Jesus Christ, you now yield your members, your body, as instruments of righteousness unto life everlasting. We talked about the two clear distinctions. If you don't get your life in tune with God correctly, if you don't get up to Christ, if you don't come to the cross, the end of that is death, and it's eternal death. Now, if you do get your life right with God, that means your life now submitted to Christ, and you're following Him, you're surrendering to Him, and your life now has eternal life, and it's not death. It leads to righteousness and life everlasting. So the important part is, first of all, make sure you got a connection. It only comes through the cross of Jesus Christ. The second part is, is make sure that you're up to date, because you're going to miss everything if you're not up to date. And I think that the way that we as Christians come to the place of understanding what it means to have the latest update is that we are walking according to the will of God for our life by yielding our life to the Holy Spirit. And the ministry of the Holy Spirit to the believer is the only way which you're going to stay in sync with God. First of all, a relationship to the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ, the gospel of good news. We come and we embrace the truth of Christ Jesus. Second of all, we have to stay in tune with the Lord. We have to submit to the, to the Holy Spirit's leadership in our life. I want to look at some passages of Scripture from Ephesians chapter 4 and then one verse out of Ephesians chapter 5. We've looked at these verses in times past, and other sermon series, and going through Bible studies together. But I want to draw out this one particular aspect of Ephesians where he's talking about the importance of being filled with the Spirit and yielding to the Holy Spirit. Verse 25, he's saying, Therefore, now, pr prior to this, he says, uh, By the way, you know, don't give place to the devil. How are, we going to, how are we not going to surrender to the devil's will? Well, we're going to lay aside lying and falsehood and speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry. And somebody say amen. But don't sin. In fact, don't let the sun go down on your anger, on your wrath. Deal with it, all right? You're going to get upset. That's all right to get upset. Just don't sin when you get upset. It's a natural, normal reaction to get mad about things. But respond in a righteous manner. So be angry, but you know, don't let the sun go down in your anger. And don't give the devil an opportunity. Let him who steals, uh, stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, performing with his own hands what is good, and in order that he may have something to share with him who, who has a need. In other words, he said, it's very simple. Quit stealing, start giving. Amen. Quit lying, start telling the truth. Quit stealing, start sharing. It's, it's just a pretty simple word, verse 29. And by the way, not just externally, internally, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such words which is good for edification according to the need of the moment that it may give grace to the one who hears. Verse 30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger Slander, clamor, be put away from you along with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Great words in which we live by. But there's a key verse in the middle of all these verses. I mean, you know, as you're reading through verse 31 and 32 there, the key verse in all of this is in verse 30, when he says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed unto the day of redemption. And, and I, I, I love the way it puts it here. He says, And do not grieve, not just the Spirit. But don't grieve the Spirit. He says, <clears throat> Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of of God. And we get this whole title here. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit is a Holy Spirit. So what grieves him? All those things that we've mentioned before and after, those unholy things. Don't grieve this Holy Spirit of God. He is the Holy Spirit of God. It's that third person in the Trinity. Very distinct person, personality. He can be grieved. He can be offended. He can be blasphemed. I mean, there's a lot that the Bible has to say about the presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. But what it is here and what he's saying here is that we should not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Ephesians 5 says, not only should we not grieve him, we ought to be filled with the Spirit. Don't be drunk with wine. That's, a, that's success. But be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because it is the Holy Spirit's responsibility in your life to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ in every area of your life. 
It's the Holy Spirit's office work, his ministry to perform in you as a Christian is to work within your life and within your heart to make you more like Christ Jesus, to transform you into the very image of Jesus Christ so that God is glorified in your life. God didn't just save us, let Jesus transform our heart and make us a new person and then leave us and abandon us to ourselves. He knew that as long as we had to contend with the flesh and with the world and with the devil, we'd need supernatural aid, supernatural life, supernatural power, spiritual strength. And so he sends his Holy Spirit into our life. We are born of the Holy Spirit. Now, I know there's some people going to get in this debate. Well, you can get born of the Spirit, and then later you've got to get the, filled with the, or get the Holy Ghost and get the Holy Spirit. No, you can't be born of the Spirit without the Spirit. That's why they say born of the Spirit. It's simple, all right? Don't confuse the, the formula. It's, it's a very simple formula. You're born of the Spirit. And when you are born of the Spirit, the Bible says you're sealed unto the day of redemption because you've been baptized through the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. Jesus is that baptizer. The Holy Spirit is the one who takes us and by sealing us unto the day of redemption, by placing us into the body of Christ, we're made a new person in Christ Jesus. But it starts with being born of the Spirit. After we're born of the Spirit, by the way, which gives us the right connection, then we are filled with the Spirit, which keeps us up to date. You with me now? Say, uh huh. First of all, we're born of the Spirit, then we're filled with the Spirit. Now he says, since you are having this indwelling Spirit in your life, Allow him to control daily. Allow him to fill you daily. And this, the Bible talks about this being filled with the Spirit in the very context, although we lose it in the English language some here. In the original language, it was the idea of a consistency, of always being, being filled. I mean, there's the day that's good for today, I'll be filled today, but when tomorrow comes, I need to be filled tomorrow. And the idea and the verb would render always be being filled with the Holy Spirit. So I, I don't need to grieve him. If the Holy Spirit is there to empower if the Holy Spirit's there to exalt Jesus as King and Master and Lord of my life, if the Holy Spirit is there to give peace and power and comfort, to give instruction, to give discipline, to give teaching, then the last thing I need to do is to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. I need to allow the Holy Spirit His full reign and full ministry in my life. You say, well, then what grieves the Holy Spirit? Well, obviously, the bottom line is we could use the word sin, but that gets down to this. What grieves the Holy Spirit is anything that deprives the Holy Spirit of bringing about the likeness of Jesus Christ in me. That's what grieves the Holy Spirit. Anything that hinders that transforming work of grace in my heart and life. Any time where I say no and choose my will and choose my way over what God wants. The Holy Spirit is the most important ministry in my life when I give my life to Jesus Christ. He's the one who helps me understand God. He's the one who helps me know God. He's the one who teaches me truth, who brings light to the Word of God. I need the ministry of the Holy Spirit or I will never be like Christ. And I will not walk in victory and I will not have any abundance and there will not be any peace nor power in my life. Now, one of the greatest offenses as far as us believers, we're, what we're concerned here, the great offense is usually gets down to this partial obedience. I mean, most are not out just living some radical, rampant, you know, a willful, disobedient, sinful, ungodly, unholy life as a child of God. Most of the people are going along through the motions. They're in church. They may even read the Bible. They may pray. But there's these things in our life which the Holy Spirit brings us to a place of obedience, and we just say no. We'll call it partial obedience. By the way, partial obedience is disobedience. But when God brings us to the place to obey Him and to exalt Jesus as the Lord of every of my life, instead I make myself the Lord. And any time I do that, when any time I say, not thy will, but my will, my way is more important, this is what I want, this is what I would like, this is what I think make me happy, then I've made myself the Lord. I've exalted myself as Lord. And I'm not being conformed or transformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm looking more like myself. And there's nothing about me that reminds me about Jesus. Amen? Amen? It is Christ in you that is the hope of glory. It is Christ in you that makes you the new person. And any time I choose to reject that, then I have grieved the Holy Spirit. Now, the thing about the, this terminology about grieving the Holy Spirit, it is a love term. It's a terminology of affection. I love you so much that when something is done that uh, 
that's offensive between you and me, then, then there's grief that takes place. We're at one side or the other. One of us is grieved in the relationship. And we wouldn't be grieved if there wasn't a deeper relationship. That's the depth of this term. If you look it up in, in a, a, say, a Greek dictionary about English translation, and you look at this word, it'd say something like irritate. Don't irritate the Holy Spirit or don't vex. But the true meaning, it gets to a deeper meaning based on fellowship and based on relationship so that you're, it, the, the hurt goes deeper. I mean, you might walk up to me as a perfect stranger and say, you're a dirty, rotten slob. And I, my feelings will be hurt for a minute. You know, like Bill Stafford says, I might have to take a baby aspirin to go to sleep tonight. You know, I might be a little affected. But if my wife were to walk up to me and say, you're a dirty, rotten slob, I would be grieved. All right? If she's serious, because she might have said that at other times when she was just joking around. But if she seriously says that to my face, or I would say something like to her, then there's a, there's a grief that takes place. It, it's like when your children, you know, you love your children, and when they just willfully and disobediently rear back and say no, you know, well, that angers you to some degree, but more importantly as a parent, because you love your child, it grieves you. Even as a parent, you know, you think about what does it grieve parents a lot? I don't know how you, what kind of home, you may have grown up as an only child, but when, uh, in a couple when there's multiple children, which means more than one, okay, when there's more than one child in the house, one of the parents' great desire is for their children to love each other and for their children to get along. And there's nothing that really satisfies a mom and a dad more than when their children get along. Now, I don't know about your children. My children didn't get along. Love each other supremely now. But boy, there were times through their lives when they would, you know, uh, just, you, you thought they would just like to kill each other and be done with it, wouldn't they? Uh, I know I'm kind of sharing something here that some may, may you be offended at. Well, get over it, all right? I've seen your kids too, all right? <laughs> I mean, kids do, they fight, but it's in home where we learn how to love. I mean, that's, that's all part of the natural process. So younger parents who have children that are maybe not getting along, it's going to be okay, all right? Don't, don't freak out. Yeah, it's, it, it does grieve you, though, does it, when they, when they don't get along? They're going to get along. God's going to do something great. And although well, my, my kids just love each other to death, well, bless your heart, and that's great. But I bet you'd like to catch some times when you're not around and see what goes on behind the scenes. Uh, I grew up in a family of six kids. We all loved each other, but we just seen each other, you know, kill each other at different times. But there's something as a parent, when you see your children act that way, it breaks your heart. You want your children to love each other because you love your kids. And you want your children to, to express that love to each other that you've sought to express to them as individuals. And when they don't, and I'm just trying to get down to the heartbeat of what this word grieve really means, when they don't, it is so personal to you that now you're experiencing grief, a heaviness, a heartache that takes place. It disturbs you within your inner being. Now, when the Holy Spirit is grieved, what happens? Well, the ministry, which was intended by the Holy Spirit to exalt Christ and empower our lives and to make us more like Jesus and to give us the strength that we need in our life, to bring the blessing of God's grace upon our life, that ministry is hindered. That, that ministry is hindered. And when the ministry of the Holy Spirit's hindered, then we're hindered. And instead of walking in integrity and in power and authority in our spiritual walk in life, now we're just going through mechanics. How many times have you ever thought to yourself in your life, well, I don't know what's the matter with me. I just don't seem to have any passion for Christ, for the Word, for the lost. Well, what, what's going on here? And you've kind of been left to the rut and the routine and the ritual. Many times, not every time, but many times, that's because we have grieved the Holy Spirit of God in some regard in our life. And the best thing we can do is spend some time with God to find out where it is and what it is in which I have grieved the Holy Spirit. Because we can go through the list. Well, I did this, this, and this. I've obeyed here and I've obeyed there, but what about in reality? I really haven't gone back to the most important place where Jesus Christ is really being exalted because I have obeyed the Lord in the areas I wanted to obey the Lord in and the areas I didn't really want to obey the Lord in. I didn't obey Him. That's when I have grieved the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, He, he just backs up and, you know, and, 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 it's, it's, and waits. And waits. And it's... it's it's a saddening that takes place. And again, we see the personality of, of the Holy Spirit in, in, in the personhood of God, that he can be grieved in this regard. Let me give you a couple of uh, biblical illustrations about how, what I'm talking about when I, when I make reference to the uh, partial obedience. A, a great illustration of this is Saul and the Amalekites. And we have preached on Saul before in the past and how he was King Saul and he was anointed by God to be the first king of Israel. God had his hand upon him. But yet Saul had a heart problem. 
All right? God had empowered him to be the king of Israel, to be the leader of Israel, but he did not step out and be what God had called him to be. And you follow his life, and it's heartbreaking. But one of the apex things where it seems that the Holy Spirit has grieved the most with, the, with Saul in, in this context is that Samuel the prophet and God have spoken to, directly to King Saul, and they've told him to go and destroy the Amalekites completely, annihilate the, n- annihilate the, the place, you know, get rid of every one of them. And uh, not only get rid of them, get rid of their sheep, their goats, the calves, the, the, the oxen, everything. Completely destroy it. And you say, well, well that's awful harsh. Uh, what's going on here? Well, if you follow the, the history of the Amalekites, they were constantly in rebellion to God. Even though given opportunity, they didn't want anything to do with God. They hated God, and they hated God's people. In fact, when the children of Israel came across the Red Sea, leaving Egypt, headed for the Promised Land, going to possess all God had for them, such as we are once we get saved, we're moving forward to possess what God has for us, the first enemy they had to deal with was the Amalekites. And this is prior to King Saul, okay? So back here in history... The people, the Amalekites, are trying to kill, trying to thwart, trying to destroy, trying to hinder the onward progression of the people of God to do God's will. Now, that's a great picture in many ways of the way the world is and the way the devil opposes us and even our own flesh. And probably if if you're going to, to do types and symbols from the Old Testament to the New Testament, the Amalekites are a great picture of the flesh. Our own willingness to stop and rebel against God when God lives in us anyway, amen. And so the Amalekites are hindering. So God tells Saul, enough's enough, judgment's come. The day of of judgment's here. You go deal with it like I've told you to deal with it. Well, Saul goes out, takes his armies, and storms into the Amalekites and destroys them all but the king. For whatever reason, it doesn't give a lot of insight here. Maybe it's a point of pride. Maybe he wants to intimidate and mock, laugh at the king in all his bondage and slavery or flaunt his superiority. Who knows? All right? Maybe it's a trophy. I don't know. But for whatever reason, he doesn't do it. Nor does he do what God said in regard to the livestock. When it comes time to destroy the livestock, he says, you know, that's a good-looking bull over there, and that's a good-looking cow, you know, for a good, good rancher, farmer mindset. Well, you don't want to kill a good animal like that. And look at, that's some good, look at those sheep. Those are prime livestock there. Let's save the best of the sheep and the oxen, you know, and the goats and cows. Let's, let's get the prime prospects from the herd and separate them and kill everything else. And he does that. But the problem is God didn't tell him to do that. God had told him just the opposite. Destroy all of it. But he, re- he retains it. He doesn't destroy all of it. He sets back and logically figures this out and says, you know, that, I think I'll keep that, that, and that. What a waste that would be. And certainly, since it'd be a waste, God understands. I'll tell you what God understands. You know, when God says something that settles the issue, it's not up for debate. Because God does and knows and always operates according to what is righteous, what is best, all right? What is the best? And th- although we don't understand it in our little puny, uh, finite minds, in the infinite mind of God, who sees all things, knows all things, can see into p- the future, and knows everything about him, he knows what's right, so I choose to respond to him. And when I don't, when I try to deliberate, have my little court session back here, pull the jury in, make a decision, I miss God. And it really doesn't matter what the public says or what my friends might say. Bottom line is, what did God say? That's what God wants. That's what I do. But not Saul. Samuel goes to tell Saul, <coughs> something's wrong here, and Saul says to Sam, Samuel says to Saul, first of all, did you do everything God told you to do? Had to be a Baptist listening to the answer. Oh, I've done everything God told me to do. <laughs> everything the Lord said do, I did. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I mean, it, it, wouldn't it be interesting if, if we put the pastors at the exit doors today and uh, every pastor was required to say, did you get everything right with God today? What kind of responses we would get? Oh, absolutely, Pastor. Hallelujah. But we're not. It's the same thing. And about the time that Saul said, oh, everything I did, you know, there's the king back there going, <coughs> that he didn't kill. And all of a sudden, according to the Scriptures, the Bible says when they're asking this question from the prophet of God, in the background you hear this noise. <laughs> It's like the cows were saying, no, he didn't do it. (laughs) Not at all. (laughs) No, it didn't happen. 
And Samuel the prophet says, if you did everything God told you to do, what is the meaning of the bleeding oxen and sheep in the background? Second way I know he's a Baptist. Oh, that? I was going to make an offering to the Lord out of that. There comes that great statement at that point where it says, obedience is greater and better than sacrifice, Saul. Obedience is better than sacrifice. But how many times do we want to enter that kind of debate? Well, I'm going to get up and go to church on time today. Uh, but I'm still not going to forgive my, my mother, my aunt, my uncle, my brother, my sister. I'm still not going to let go of this sin. And I know i got a little secret thing going over here on the Internet, but I'm not going to give that up either. But I'm going to be in church, bless God, and I'm going to tithe. <laughs> kind of, you know, it's like, I don't know, let's make a deal. Somebody told me they redid that show. It's out on TV again. But the old let's make a deal, you know, that's out there is Monty Hall that did it back in the, the old days. That's back when we had black and white TV back in the, the 90s, okay? That's what some of y'all think. Anyway, <laughs> you know, let, I, 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 I don't want that. I'll take what's behind door number one. But I'd like to trade door number one for, yeah, this, this prize over here. You don't do that with God. And this is exactly what we're talking about. This is what grieves the Holy Spirit of God. We don't do. We, and, and like, if we do like Saul, who said, oh, I'm so sorry, I repent. And he, he did this little repentance act. But even in that, he wasn't genuine. So how do you know? Read the story because later on it says, and Saul went to Samuel and said, I repented, but don't tell anybody. Got to keep my image up. Got to keep my image up. It's exactly what we do. Now, I'm sure probably some of you have already arrived, and this is never an issue in your life, but it certainly is an issue in my life, and it's an issue in almost every Christian's life I know of. We just have, we want to go part way and then somehow deliberate with God that part way is good enough. Oh, tr genuine obedience is always immediate, and genuine obedience is always complete if it's genuine obedience. Another illustration of this is, is back in the Old Testament, by the way, the, the, the way the Bible says these things are written, you know, for our edification, is the story of Israel. Remember they, when they, they are leaving we talked about how the Amalekites met them. They've crossed the Red Sea, and now they've 40 years, 38, 40 years, they're wandering around the wilderness. They finally get up to the Jordan to cross the river, and Joshua is leading the way across, and, and God says, okay, when you go in there, every place you put your foot is yours. You take possession of it. It's going to be a war. There's going to be a battle, but hey, you'll win. Don't worry about it. You're going to win the war. Just move forward in my name and do what I tell you to do. And by the way, drive all the inhabitants out of the land. Possess it completely. Well, we know that if you read the Bible and study a little bit of biblical history, they didn't drive all the inhabitants out of the land. They left some of the inhabitants in the land. They didn't completely obey the Lord God. And although it seemed adequate and sufficient for the moment, the tragedy was their disobedience in the present, even though it seemed to be okay, and they got away with it, led to tremendous problems in the future for the nation of Israel. And had they done what they were supposed to do back in that present moment, they would have never had to deal with the issues they had to deal with in the future. And so often that's the way it is as Christians. We put off doing something what God wants us to do. Now, maybe we feel it's too much a sacrifice, or, or maybe we like a situation or a certain person. When God said, this is not the you're supposed to deal with. This is what I want. But, Lord, I like this. And so we embraced it, and everything seemed fine until you get down the road. And then you begin to realize there's all kinds of pitfalls that God saw ahead of you and all kinds of problems that this would produce. The children of Israel, they left three of the tribes in the promised land. They left the tribe of Gath, Gaza, and Ashdod. Left all three of them which seemed to be acceptable for the moment, but when you study biblical history, you'll go back and you'll see how every one of these that they left created problems. Gath later produced a man, a giant man, nine foot, nine inches tall, by the name of Goliath. And remember Goliath who comes and taunts the whole armies of Israel. For days they stay in encampment and they won't go into the battle and run out the Philistines because there's Goliath of Gath standing in the middle of the valley all by himself, intimidating and taunting the armies of the living God. And it says day in and day out, for days this went on, day in, they'd wake up in the morning, the armies of Israel, and it said they would dress and meet and battle array. They would get together, put on the armor, sing the songs of battle, to decide the marching orders of the day, get up to the front line and be intimidated. How many times 
been places in your heart or in your life when you didn't exactly do what God wanted you to do, and now you're facing a giant. Something that just looks unbeatable, unbearable. It stands there and intimidates you day in and day out. And if you'd only done what the Lord had said, do. David the psalmist is going through this, and, and, and I mean Solomon is in Proverbs with his son. He says, you're going to get to the point, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, you're going to say, why did I not listen to instruction? Why didn't I hear what God wanted me to do and, and do that? We don't want to live our life with regrets. And the way to avoid living your life with regrets falling into holes and falling into traps and being deceived out in the future ahead of you is to do what you know God would have you do now. Instead of facing a Goliath that you don't want to have to face today and you don't want to have to deal with today, you could be walking in victory. Instead, you're having to face that giant. The next tribe that was left was Gaza. We know that Gaza still brings problems to this day. God said, drive them out. Gaza produced a pretty little girl by the name of Delilah. And Samson... Because he wouldn't completely obey the Lord. Samson, who experienced a, a supernatural birth, born when his mother had been barren, God gave this boy. We have experienced a supernatural birth. We are born again in Christ. Samson, who was called to be a deliverer. We've been called to be deliverers. Samson, who was graced with great strength. We've been given the Holy Spirit of God. Samson just couldn't let go of women. Always had to have a woman in his life. And it always had to be the wrong one, Delilah. And she brought this mighty man of God down. He's blinded, and demobilized, and doing the work of a common donkey for the Philistines while they rail at him and ridicule him. And a man whose life should have been, had one trait of the grace and the power and the glory of God manifest him now becomes the laughing stock of the enemy. And only in his death is there any victory. What a tragedy. And what a tragic ending. But how many people have done the same thing in their life? Because they wouldn't deal with something. Their life's living in bondage and captivity. And then there's Ashdod. The people of Ashdod, they should have been... Years later, this tribe shows up and they steal the Ark of the Covenant. The most valuable treasure to the people of, of Israel. It is the place where in the holy presence of God would come and dwell. It's the place where sins would be confessed. The blood would be sprinkled on the altar. The glory of God would be manifest. Now it's gone. How many people, because they didn't deal with something right now, and as difficult as it might be to deal with it now, if you say no to it later on, you're going to find yourself robbed of the very presence. No, yes, he's present, but the, the knowledge of his presence, the joy that comes from his presence, the power that emanates from that, the peace that comes from that, walk with, it'll be gone because you allowed the enemy to steal it. Partially. We just kind of going part way. We're kind of doing what God wants, but we're still holding and maintaining particular rights to ourselves. And what happens? Well, the Holy Spirit is grieved. And when he's grieved, he just kind of backs up and waits. We know in Scripture that the Holy Spirit is likened unto a bird, and he's likened unto a dove. And a dove, because a dove is a clean bird. You say, what do you mean? Well, there's some animals that the Bible calls clean animals and some the Bible calls unclean animals, all right? And the dove is a clean animal. In other words, you won't see, if, if you drive down the road and you see somebody's hit that dog or ran over that squirrel or killed that deer and they're laying there in the ditch and you see all these buzzards all around it, you're not going to see a dove trying to elbow his way in there and get him some of that. You don't want anything to do with it. It's death. It's decay. It's rotten. And a dove won't do anything like that. He's a clean bird. In fact, do you know that doves mate for life? You ever see a dove by himself? If you see a dove by himself, that's usually because he's just new bird. It's just very, not very old at all. Or because his mate's been killed. By one of you terrible hunters. And it, and I, that, you know I'm a hunter, so take that the right way, okay? <laughs> he just mates for life. So you always see him in pairs. When the Holy Spirit comes into your life, he's made it to you for life. The Bible says, whom we are sealed by. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. We've been sealed unto the day of redemption. Hallelujah. That's good news. He is clean, though. He is the Holy Spirit of God. He's not the unholy. The Holy Spirit doesn't want to fellowship 
with that which is death and that which is bitter and that which is hard and that which is harsh and that which is, that which is decaying. It's, it's not that within the personality of God. The Holy Spirit is holy. He brings life. And He only associates and fellowships with life. So whenever we choose sin, that's choosing death. Obedience unto righteousness, sin unto death, as we talked about last week. A great illustration that Scripture gives us, if you follow this illustration of the dove and the Holy Spirit, you know, you see the Holy Spirit moving over the face. It's the whole idea of brooding like a mother hen even. But if you follow this whole idea of the, of the dove concept through Scripture, it's fascinating. In fact, it just makes you want to shout. In, in the Bible, when the Holy Spirit's likened to a dove, he's there because he's clean. In fact, a dove doesn't even have a gallbladder, all right? He's just a clean bird. And if you follow the Scriptures, you remember that Noah... In the ark, y'all do remember the story, right? You saw the movie, you didn't? Okay. He's in the ark, and he's been there many, many days, multiple weeks now, and he, no one wants to know, is there any land anywhere? Remember, the flood has covered the entire face of the earth. Death reigns supreme. Judgment has fallen. The only safe place was in the ark. Only his family and those who chose righteousness within his family, they were safe because of the ark. They found safety. They found deliverance. They found that there's no judgment that could fall upon them. So as they're in the ark, Noah said, is there any place to park this boat yet? Is there any place to light? And so he comes and he, to this conclusion, he takes a dove, remember, and he lets the dove go out of the ark. And he releases the dove from the ark. Why? Because he knows that when releasing the dove, that, that it will come back if there's no place to land. If there's nothing out there but death, I mean, all you got around is floating carcasses from death and the disease and the decay. If that's all that's out there, the dove's not going to land. Why? He's clean. He's not going to light on that stuff. He's not even going to take a ride on it, okay? So if there's no place to rest, there's no place to eat, he's going to come back to the only place, and that is going to be to the ark. And so the first time, he comes back because there's only death. The second time, Noah, a little time goes by, he takes the dove and he releases it again a second time. And the scripture tells us that the dove came back with an olive branch that it had plucked from a tree, came back with a branch in his mouth, representing peace. But Literally, it's interesting because as you study Scripture and you look at this particular passage, when you look up the word plucked in the Hebrew language, it's literally the word bruised. That the olive tree was bruised and brings back that message, and the dove brings back that message that there is life, there's, a, there's, there's safety out there, there's peace now, there, there's something that's clean out there, there's a place to land, and, and that's why the dove was sent out. So he, he could come back with a message, and he does come back, that there's hope. And it, basically the dove in Scripture for us is, is, the, is the sign that there's hope of life, and there's hope of grace, and there's hope of mercy. And then the third time the dove is released from the ark, he doesn't come back. Someone said, you know, if you take this story and you liken it to the first time, that the, the dove is released, it's, he's let go for the Father. And the Father looks upon all mankind and he sees nothing but death. No, no place in which he can place his life and fill life. Why? Because all men have sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Then the Holy Spirit is released a second time. The second time, there's this message that comes from a bruise that takes place on a tree. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ was wounded and bruised for our sins, for our iniquities. The dove brings back a message of grace. So the second time he's released representing the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God that Jesus Christ died, the death he died on the tree, that he was plucked, that he was wounded, that he was bruised for our iniquities so that we can have life. The third time the dove is released, you don't see him again in Scripture. He hadn't come back. The Holy Spirit. There's no place to light. There's no place to light. And you don't see him after this. The law is given. Well, there's no grace in the law. The law brings death. The law is a tutor. It's a teacher for us. It shows us that God's holy, but it also reveals to us our own unholiness. The Holy Spirit doesn't light on that and give grace there because there's, there's only a sentence of death that comes from the law, that the wages of sin is death. But then we get this message from the New Testament. In fact, there's the law and there's judgment and the prophecies and there's all this doom and all this judgment that, that, that's, that's there. But in the midst of that, there's all these prophecies about a coming day. 400 years of silence go between the last writing of the New Testament to the first writing of the, uh, of the Old Testament to the first writing of the New Testament 400 years, that's a long time. 400 years, no dove. 400 years of silence. 
in one day. There's a prophet standing on the banks of the Jordan River. And he's preaching, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And as he's preaching, people are responding in brokenness and repentance. One lone figure begins to make his way from the back of that crowd to the front of that crowd and walks right up to John. And as he's making his way through the crowd, John declares, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Behold, that's the one who's going to deal with the gall, the bitterness, the death, the sin. He's going to take it away. He walks up to John and says, baptize me, John. And we know the story. John says, I, I'm not even worthy to tie the laces on your sandals. Baptize me. John takes him to the Jordan River to immerse him in those cold Jordan River. And as he takes him and baptizes him, guess what? Here comes that dove. Not only the law, not at Mount Sinai, not 400 years of silence, but now the dove returns. When does the dove return? Song of Solomon puts it this way. When it says in Scripture, it says, when, when is the, the sound of the turtle dove? He said, well, it's after the winter's past. When the rain is over and gone, the flowers will appear in the earth, and the time of singing of birds has come, and the voice of the dove is heard in our land. The dove returns when that which hindered the Holy Spirit has been dealt with, and what hinders the Holy Spirit is sin. And when we come to Jesus Christ, God deals with our sin, amen? But as we walk with Jesus Christ, God begins to deal with our sins, plural, the issues, the parts of our life, and the Holy Spirit shows us those things that will hinder. It's like that sweet, precious dove lighting upon our life. And when he came, there on that day, and the dove descended upon Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit, like a dove, descends upon him. And God says, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And by the way, the dove came back to the real ark. The first ark was just a symbol. The judgment is coming. There's only one safe place. It's within the ark. Folks, the greater judgment is coming. There's only one way to escape the wrath of God, and that's the ark, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we must enter into him while it's called today, the scripture says, enter into Christ because the door is going to be shut one day and nobody else is going to get in. And so the Holy Spirit draws us to the real ark, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we experience the grace of the Holy Spirit when we deal with the things that are a hindrance to the Holy Spirit. And see what happens. I mean, Jesus is bruised on the tree for our sins. He's raised from the dead. And then the promise of the dove, the promise of the Holy Spirit, which the Old Testament promise, prophets had promised, is now coming. Joel says it's going to come a day when God's going to rest up in the, upon the hearts of men, all men. And it came. The day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell, Peter said, this is that which the prophet Joel spoke about. The Holy Spirit of God can now rest in the hearts of men. And people cried out, what must we do to be saved? He says, repent. Turn your life over to Christ, because he will deal with the things that block, that hinder, that, re that repel the Holy Spirit. He'll deal with the sin in your life. He'll make you clean. He'll wash your sins. He'll forgive you. He'll remove the shame and the guilt. He'll make you whole and new. And the Holy Spirit can rest upon your life. 3,000 people, men at least, and thousands of others were saved that day. Why? Because the Holy Spirit came in power. When do we experience the same kind of power in our life? And we allow the Holy Spirit to not be grieved in our life. When we're walking with hearts that are willing to be pliable and teachable, not embracing that junk in our life that's going to bring us terrible times down the road if we don't repent of it. It's interesting when you see that verse 30 says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. The verse is on both sides of it, starting that verse around 25 and then all the way through the end of the chapter. Look at the verses on both sides. The first part of it says on the first side, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. But only such a word that is good for edification according to the need of the moment that it may give grace to those who hear. And he says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. In other words, what comes out of my mouth the things that proceed from my mouth. Those are the things that hinder the Holy Spirit. After this says, so let the bitterness and the wrath and the anger and the clamor and the slander be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. 
How do we grieve the Holy Spirit? Proverbs 29 says, The hypocrite with his mouth destroys his neighbor. I think the way we grieve the Holy Spirit more than any other way is with our mouth. What comes out of our mouth ought to be life-giving, ministering grace to the hearer. I shared with you a few weeks ago, we did our series on the Glorious Church, a story about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German theologian and pastor who was jailed because he was part of an assassination plot on Hitler's life and was sentenced to death and he died. But Bonhoeffer, they say, up leading to the execution for the days and the months that he was in prison, every day when they would open the cells for time for the prisoners to get out and exercise or meet in the yards or whatever, he said, those that knew him, wrote him, he said, every day he would go prisoner, prisoner to prisoner and speak words of grace to encourage, to minister, to say something about Christ, to encourage their life, to say something that would help them, to say something that would relieve them. He didn't go cell to cell, prison to prison, talk about how bad the weather was, how bad the traffic was, how miserable the president was, how miserable Hitler was. It's what about it. He wanted to say things that would give grace to those, that would encourage people who heard it. How much of what we say every day is encouragement to anybody? And when we don't do that, it's because our hearts usually harden, because we're not allowing the Holy Spirit in our own life, because we've grieved the Holy Spirit by bitterness, by anger that hadn't been resolved, by malice. And what comes out instead? Listen, what comes out of a bitter fountain is bitter water. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit by which it's been sealed with the day of redemption. If you want to experience the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, because He is present, but if you want it to be a genuine experience in your life, embrace the truths of Ephesians chapter 4 by not giving place to the enemy, by not holding on to the things that you hold dear, but holding on to things that God holds dear. I'll close with this simple illustration, and I know, I know I've shared that, and I've shared elements of this message, and but, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. We keep saying the same things over and over again week after week so that we remember because we are prone in our mortality and in our fleshliness to forget. So we must be reminded over and over. But I remember hearing the story the first time from a pastor who shared this illustration. Uh, we've mentioned Manly Beasley, and some of you have read his materials or heard messages from Brother Beasley. But I remember sitting back in the mid to late 70s in a service as a young preacher boy, hearing him preach, talking about the Holy Spirit and grieving the Holy Spirit, but he closed with this illustration. And it was a true story about a missionary friend had told him. And he says, you know, he said, I had this missionary friend who pastored a church that was really blowing and going up in the Ozark Mountains. And great church, doing great things for God. People are getting saved and baptized. The church was going, great unity of the Spirit, great relationship between the body of Christ. And, but in the middle of all that great move of God, he was called to a mission field. He said he went and he left for several years to the mission field. But when he came back to visit the church, he was a few miles down in a little valley area before you get up to where the church was, and he was gassing his car up. He was going to go up, his plans were to go visit the church and visit the people. While he was gassing his car up, he ran into a church member there at the gas station, and they fellowshiped for a little bit. And he said, by the way, man, that God was doing so much at the church. How's it going? I want to go by there on my, on my way to where I'm headed and, and, and see the church and see what God's doing and visit with the people. And the person at the gas station was a little reluctant and bowed their head a little bit. Said, "Well, Pastor, you know, uh, I don't know how to tell you this, but the church ain't even open anymore." To which she was quite amazed. Not even open. What happened? I mean, God was moving in such great ways. It's not even open. He said, "I, I don't know how to explain it." He said, "I tell you what." If you'll make your way up to the church, you're going the way, you're going to pass it anyway. They've put a sign out right before you get to the church. When you come around that last curb where the church is, yeah, I know it. There'll be a sign on the road there that explains why the church is closed. Well, the pastor's curiosity is driving up the hills. And if you ever drove through the Ozarks, it's back and around and back and around. Finally makes that last curb to where the church is. And as he comes around to see the church just in the distance, there's only one sign and it's a highway sign placed there right in front of the church, and it said this, Slow children at play. And I think that's too descriptive of the church today. Too many people playing church. Some of you have children that like to play church. 
they get up and they've got the preacher and the ushers and everything. And I think that's what's happened far too much in the modern church today. Because people won't embrace the truth of the Holy Spirit's presence in our life, and He is a Holy Spirit. And we think we can embrace the Holy Spirit and live our unholy lives. And we don't experience the passion, the power, the peace, the grace of God in our lives. And what have we done? We've played church. And the Holy Spirit is grieved. And He sits back and He waits for us. Yes, He'll come with conviction. He'll continue to woo us and even bring chastening in our life to get us to the point to respond and receive the grace of God. But if we grieve the Holy Spirit, then we're cutting short everything God planned for our lives and everything that God wants to do in us. If you find yourself in this position of being one of those children at play, then I ask you today to allow God to do a deep introspection into your heart and spirit and see just where it was back here, Gath, Gaza, Ashton, whatever it was in your life that robbed you and brought you to such a place of emptiness and get in your, in your heart to the place where David talked about hating sin and hating wickedness and hating Satan. That we come to that kind of place in our life where we love God. We love truth. We love grace because of what God has done for us and what God does in us. There's no joy in your salvation. There's no power in your walk. There's no peace in your, in your existence. And somewhere down the line, you've chose to be like Saul, perhaps. Just kind of going partway with the Lord doing just enough in your mind to be enough. But somewhere you have to get to the place saying, oh, God, I want revival. God, I want reality. God, I want your presence. Let it begin right here in my life today. I don't want to be a child at play. Would you stand with your heads bowed?